Let's go into a little bit more depth on the input processing side, the bottom of that diagram that we showed. So the first thing we need to do is convert our words into tokens. We call this token uh, tokenization. So again, we can't just deal with words in a neural network. We need to deal with numerical values, right? So the first thing we need to do is called tokenization. And that's not quite as simple as you might think. So at the end of the day, most words end up getting mapped to a single token, a single numerical value. And OpenAI has this handy little tool on its website where you can type in whatever you want and it will show you how it was tokenized. So each color here represents a different token that represents that word. So usually there's a one-to-one -one mapping. Many becomes its own token, words becomes its own token, so on and so forth. Note that uh, punctuation is generally its own token as well. And some words get split up into multiple tokens, like here indivisible is not indivisible at all. It's actually three separate tokens, one for ind, one for iv, and one for isable. And it just learns how to do that. Again, these things are trained, right? So if it learns that there's some value into splitting these larger words up into individual tokens for making the system work better, then it will. Some things kind of make intuitive sense, like, you know, contractions, apostrophe T should probably be its own token because it means not. Um, and also it has to deal with things like Unicode in a specific way too. Those tend to get mapped to their own individual tokens as well. It can do some weird things too. Like if it has a sequence of characters that we commonly see next to each other, it might decide to make a to token just for that sequence as well. So here, for example, one, two, three is being broken out as its own token that just means one, two, three. So that's kind of interesting. Beyond that, it has to do token encoding after the tokenization is done. So again, we end up converting that into a vector in this multi-dimensional embedding space as the next step. That basically captures the semantic relationships between tokens or similarities between different tokens. Mathematically, you can think of the angle between two vectors that represent two different tokens in this embedding space as the uh, cosine similarity metric between the two of them. After that, we have to do what's called positional encoding. So that gets added into the token embedding as well. And the idea there is to capture some information about the positions of the tokens relative to the other tokens around it. Now, how do we do that in a way that uh, works across any given length of tokens? You know, how do I capture that information really concisely when I don't really know upfront how long this sequence of characters is? Am I giving it a whole book? Am I giving it a short sentence? What is it, right? So one trick is to use a sinusoidal function. And if you remember your, your high school math, sine waves kind of repeat forever, right? They have this period and it just goes up and down, up and down forever. Same thing with cosine. It's just sort of split off and phase shifted by 90 degrees or whatever it is, right? And if you embed these two things together, you just interleave the cosines and the sines, you end up with something like this in this particular example. And we'll show you an example of actually generating this graph and where it comes from. But the idea is that we take the value of where that position lies on this sine wave or on this cosine wave to encode some information about where it is relative to other tokens within it, right? So we take the position of the token, we pass it through this positional encoding, and we get a representation of where this token is amidst the other tokens around it. And yes, this will repeat eventually, but when done right, um, by that point, you're so far away from the other tokens that it doesn't matter anymore. So that's the basic idea of what we're doing on the input side. Let's also take a closer look at the output side. So you might remember at the top of our diagram, we had our final decoder block. And at the top of that, we have a feed forward neural network that's gonna spit out an output vector of some sort. Now, how do we turn that into an actual word that we want to generate? So we take that vector and we multiply it by the token embeddings. And that ultimately gives us the probabilities of each token being the next token. So pretty cool how that works. It's pretty simple, really. So what we end up with after taking that output vector from this giant transformer and its trillion parameters or whatever it is, and we, we just multiply that by the embedding matrix and we get these logits, these probabilities of each token being an appropriate next token in this sequence, all right? Now, if you want to, you can just pick the one with the highest probability and go with that. That's what we would call a temperature of zero. So if you want the results to always be deterministic, you can specify a low temperature to say, I really want to have a bias toward picking the most likely next token. But if you want to have some randomness, some variability, the ability to get different responses every time, you might introduce a little bit of uh, randomness there, right? A little bit of probability. Maybe there's a chance that it'll pick one with a logit of 0 0.5 and say, uh, uh, this, wow, this course is hard instead of, wow, this course is amazing, right? That's what we call temperature. And you see that parameter in a lot of these models.